Basically, uh, the concept is not new, and what I will do is just to go through these things and perhaps focus on our experience. I believe we have the largest number of patients in so far, and we're hoping that shortly we'll report the long-term or mid-term uh, result of our patients. And I'll go through these uh, axes. So, basically, Fontan is the um, final palliation for a functional or anatomical single ventricle. And... Uh, has gone through many modifications, and I don't need to go actually through this. Most of you know this, and it's a common knowledge now, how do we stage single ventricle? And this is the most prevalent form of the anatomical uh, um, fontan uh, completion, the intracardiac or the lateral tunnel fontan and the extracardiac tunnel fontan. And the technical detail, as I said, has, has gone through a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of modification. But what everybody noticed across uh, continents that the long-term survival depends on the morbidity associated with uh, the palliations that uh, those single ventricle patients go through. And it's in, needless to say that they're accumulative. This is the raw data from our, uh, actually, uh, Fontan population, a cohort over three, four years. And that just reiterate the fact that those patients go um, with an increasing uh, number of mortality. And the longer you follow them, the proved to have more mortality and so. And this is one of the common morbidity that's associated with the procedures. And this is, again, a cohort that we had published about the, or the, our surgeon published about the AV repair in Fontan. And you can see for yourself the commonest among those uh, ones, particularly in the po immediate post-operative uh, uh, period is the pleural effusions. And the other chronic problems and other uh, things that we did not put on this table and they are less common. So intuitively, if one would think that reducing the number of surgeries will be beneficial and reduce the mortality and morbidity. And so can we uh, reduce uh, uh, the number of palliation and the stresses that the patient go through in order for us to achieve this goal? So people focus on the second stage. Can we design it to avoid doing another uh, uh, bypass surgery and sometimes uh, for uh, uh, good reasons uh, uh, rest also time? The concept is not new, and this has come. I just, uh, um, um, uh, Dr. Felix just taught me a while ago that uh, uh, Dr. Gunertz is a surgeon. He's a lead surgeon in the uh, Garesh, if I pronounce it uh, Okay, so that's university in Berlin, which now Berlin Heart Institute, where Felix works, uh, uh, belong to. And so the concept was two decades ago. It's not really new. And uh, they, they, they were case reports, and the people carried, uh, carried more patients. But it's the courage of Gerd uh, Hausdorff. He was, I was told, very, very intelligent uh, catheterizer. His, the, uh, the, and his colleagues to go uh, ahead and actually embark on this uh, approach on a high-risk patients. And they had published this again um, about 18 years ago or so. However, there was a lot of problems with the, their patient's cohort. I think most, um, most prominently it's associated with their patient selection. Though those patients were really very high risk, and they thought that if they could avoid Fontan, they will, um, they will uh, produce a more effective result. Then through the literature, there are people who actually come with um, some publication about the procedure. And, you know, the concept of the covered synth came along. And uh, this gentleman, and I was also taught by Felix uh, Berger this very early morning when I sat next to him, that this gentleman is a surgeon too, and he works out in Columbia. I don't know whether he's still there or not. But also they have reported some, uh, some uh, patients. So, when Dr. Salah Dean joined us, as I said, in two, two, 2003, and because we have a very large populations of those, uh, of those patients, we thought that we would probably carry on on the same, uh, you know, calculated and carefully crafted um, uh, um, intervention on those patients. But we really did not have the tools, nor we had actually the... Uh, uh, the support or the uh, uh, patient mix to uh, design a randomized on an RCT on those ones. So this is just to describe the techniques that we have used in our institution. And basically, we cl they, the, our surgeon, Dr. Salahaddin and Dr. Halis, they closed the SVC within the right atrium with a precardial patch. And uh, the RPA, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, but the batch is blind, so there is no connection between the uh, bidirectional gland and the fontan. 
And when they come for the uh, transcutaneous uh, or transcatheter completion, that patch is uh, penetrated and stinted. And also an aperture that is formed in the lateral tunnel is designed to, uh, uh, to uh, carry on with the physiology and hemodynamic of the glen. And so much was really written about it, how much you leave to actually carry the lower body circulation. So I think Salahuddin has studied some of the, uh, some animal work and some ex uh, earlier experiments with it. And we ha I think uh, at the time I wasn't really part of the discussion, but they went by the IVC diameter. And, and they had put, actually put a, a haphazard, um, not haphazard, but calculated on the diameter IVC that they will create aperture size. And I think the notion was that whatever aperture that you create on those lateral tunnels, that tends to shrink after surgery. Uh, so they would actually oversize it, and they will incrementally go up with the size of the, uh, of the uh, IVC. Um, and then uh, the final surgical product uh, is going to be, as I pointed out, and this is actually a schematic um, a view that uh, Ahmed Salahuddin has drawn in one of the publications in 2007 where uh, this, uh, the, our stents, our, uh, Dr. Fadli will come and do his uh, stenting. So um, from 2002 to 2007, this is the early uh, experience, we had this much of bidirectional glen and uh, the standard one were 193 and as I said it was not really um, uh, controlled. Nor we, uh, uh, nor we were just uh, pre-selecting patients. Uh, and I think there, there was lots of uh, uh, feedbacks that uh, uh, Salah Dean and Baal Sufi and the surgical group got out of uh, presenting their data in every conference on how did they choose and pre-select this patient. But these are the guidelines that they went by. Uh, uh, they would be uh, not candidate for single stage at the time of preparation. They, i.e. if they had a band or if they had a shunt, one would not say, well, they're suitable for entire to do it, so they'll just, uh, they'll just uh, be ready for the bidirectional glen. Uh, they would have a good distribution, uh, and uh, they will have a single right side, the SVC, and they have a normal uh, uh, pulmonary venous uh, uh, connection. And we, they had actually put these things to sort of um, um, perhaps have a better chance, better shot in producing relatively result or giving Dr. Fadli and our group a better shot at producing really um, good result compared with their surgical approach. And usually the catheter completion, if we can uh, uh, hold Dr. Fadli from jumping on those patients, we will wait for 10 months and, uh, and do them. And I, I will show you that later on in the experiments we have actually done earlier on. So this is just the runoff of those three 34 patients that they, they have gone under this procedure. We have, and I will show you um, just a schematic, and I, this is just a very quick run on the uh, procedure itself, and I will be showing you some of these uh, angios, and I will be very happy to answer them to the best of uh, my knowledge, I have assisted Dr. Fadli in probably a dozen of them, but he is the primary operator. So usually he will have a right uh, IJ and an IVC axis, and he will look at the patch very carefully. He will use even a, st uh, he will use a stiff wire, or uh, uh, if a Gore-Tex was used for a reason or other, he will use an RF. I think there was only one patient that an RF was used. Now, later on on that, uh, uh, on that group of patients, uh, our surgeon has also gotten a more surgical modification. They will just create a pouch and they will have a circular suture around, um, yeah, around this lesion. So, um, um, so what uh, Dr. Fadli needs to do is just to penetrate it and just tear it with a balloon and uh, accounting on the fibrosis and the healing around those suture that the tract, the upper tract of the fountain will be uh, kept intact. Okay, I hope this changed, there you go. Um, and I think this is <clears throat> one of the patients that he used RF uh, on, on uh, this patient, but uh, it wasn't really a, a, a technique that he used uh, or we used a lot. And then he will dilate it uh, progressively with a, a, a balloon. After establishing the connection, a very small connection between uh, both, uh, both ends, a uh, patient usually uh, 
uh, don't go uh, uh, through any hemodynamic instability, but I think um, uh, earlier on, uh, he had become very careful, so he would position the SVC because this is the only um, escape that the, the cardiac output will completely escape from the uh, right side to the left side if he established a big connection between the glen and the fontan. So he would position his device there, and once he has the uh, stent mounted, he will... Um, uh, Okay, he will inflate it here, and you will see that the, the stent gets uh, compressing the amplatzer or the uh, disk, uh, uh, disk um, device. And this will be, the <coughs> this will be uh, a final uh, shape of the, uh, such patient. And again, this is the run of uh, what those patients had uh, um, gone uh, through, and uh, it's quite significantly you see all uh, the comparison with the surgical group that we had, they, uh, we, ha we had taken a cohort to compare them significantly much less in every immediate post-operative period. And also having the surgeon have the, uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, speed by which they remove their uh, CT uh, drainage. Now I will go through uh, some of the uh, uh, patients that we had, uh, we had observed on, the, on them. I am uh, and again, I repeat, I am not really the best one to go through it, and uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the team, so uh, I'll be very happy to answer questions if uh, anybody has uh, to the best of uh, my knowledge. But we have two patients that they had be taken down, and um, uh, basically uh, after doing the GLEN, they discovered that they have obstruction of, the, uh, of a left SVC. Uh, one of the patients has a very high PVR, and... Uh, Three of, uh, of our patients had uh, diaphragmatic paralysis. And this is just, uh, I think it's about uh, four years, uh, five years from the inception of the first patient until late 2010 that Baha Sufi, who joined us uh, two years earlier than the publication of this, had gone and reviewed the uh, percutaneous and the surgical comparison group and published this in one of the uh, surgical papers. And this is just a schematic view of those patients. And I have to add that here um, uh, we still uh, did not miss any uh, more patient than the other two. However, we had missed communication with four of the patients and one of our fellow working very hard to uh, get follow-up on them. And uh, on the re-stenosis, I don't know whether this table showed it or not, but we had uh, added three patients uh, to uh, further dilate the stent, and here I'm trying just to find where is the number that reflect the recatheterization surgical level. So it doesn't show up here, but anyhow, out of those 23 patients that are alive and uh, put through this uh, put through this uh, uh, procedure, we have um, uh, we have a uh, uh, total of four patients that we needed to bring back for redilatation. And these are some of the curves that uh, Dr. Sufi had presented in uh, his publication uh, on the survival. Um, and I would summarize that uh, uh, the lessons and observation that we have made on this group that, uh, you know, the anastomotus of the stump um, or to the inferior cavity ca was exactly in front of the superior vena cava. And we I really don't know the impact of this on flow hemodynamics at the end when we establish the continuity through with a covered stent or with a bare stent. Uh, the font uh, preparation is lengthy, so that's a payback. You know, if you, they go with just a, a simple gland, it will be a much shorter uh, procedure and sometimes off bypass. And the notion that you create actually <clears throat> a lot less uh, bypass and cardiac arrest time, you protect the myocardium was the biggest lure, I think, for uh, everybody to embark on this uh, project and everybody really wanting to improve the uh, technique and carry on with it. <clears throat> and uh, needless to say, the confounding variable is the underlying diagnoses and the comorbidity and the ventricular function that uh, is very difficult to evaluate on those single uh, patients. And um, we have... Our group had learned making really arbitrary decisions about effectiveness of any intervention, as you all know, based on observation, is really not acceptable to disseminate therapy across. 
so the need is still is very strong for randomized controlled trial for this patient. Further innovation, we expect that to improve the procedure and to uh, uh, give us really a, a better hand on the uh, on the, uh, on the outcome of those patients. And we certainly need a detailed long follow-up on the hemodynamics and the growth of these stents that we put and the incidence of the re-intervention complications such as the uh, arrhythmias and the embolic, embolic uh, phenomena. So I would conclude by saying that the transcatheter completion is achievable and it carries a lower, we think, immediate overall peri-procedure, immediate post-operative risks potentially eliminate the final surgical stage while maintaining stage approach, allow for successive dilatation of fontan, particularly if you put really a stent that is dilatable to an adult size. Additional advantage of it is the faster recovery. The increasing importance of multidisciplinary approach for complex lesion is really, really, really very clear on this approach. So surgeons and interventions has to talk all the time about the detailed anatomy that they face and they have to work together. Now I should also add something that is not in the slide with the advent now of a lot of sophisticated imaging and you know the 3D prototyping, I think that will be really helpful to pre-select and follow those patients through and judge which one are going to be really best candidate for this. Um, and uh, as I said, we're working to um, uh, report the long-term follow-up. Thank you very much.